Good morning, everybody, and welcome to OCO's first 2018 event. Um, today, we're featuring our esteemed guest, Dr. Ron Ross, who's a fellow at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. Um, Dr. Ross's focus areas include information security, system security engineering, and risk management. A graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, Dr. Ross served in many leadership and technical positions during his 20-year career in the U.S. Army. Currently, he leads um, FISMA, the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, implementation project, which includes the development of security standards and guidelines for the federal government, contractors, and United States critical infrastructure. In addition to his responsibilities at NIST, Dr. Ross supports the U.S. State Department in the International Outreach Program for Information Security and Critical Infrastructure Development. And as if he's not busy enough, Dr. Ross also leads the Joint Task Force, an interagency partnership responsible for the development of the Unified Information Security Framework for the federal government and its contractors. Dr. Ross has an amazing gift in articulating why information security is important to us all at every level. Here at DOI, cybersecurity is a priority, and we take protecting our environment very seriously. Our team is continuously working to safeguard you and DOI's data against malicious activities while protecting DOI as a team effort. Um, we all have to stay vigilant in securing this environment. I hope that by participating in today's event, you benefit from understanding how we all contribute to securing our environment. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Ross to the Department of the Interior. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Gosh, uh, DOI was the first federal agency that I interacted with when I came to NIST a long, long time ago. And I was just thinking as I was coming in the main door today, walking down that beautiful hallway and seeing this wonderful renovation, how special DOI is in the federal government and the, the gift that you give to all of the uh, people out there, the American people. Um, I raised my two kids, they're, they're grown up now, but I took them to a lot of national parks and all the things that you work so hard every day to give that enjoyment to the American people. I, I wanna thank you uh, for, for all the work that you do. Uh, Sylvia and Larry and Rotimi, and thank you for inviting me here today to give you an hour's worth of training and talk about some pretty important stuff. I, I wanna start by saying, gosh, the CIO and the CISO and all the people who work in cybersecurity today and all the folks who are here from other agencies and on the live stream, you absolutely have the <clears throat> most difficult job of I think any federal employee today. The things that we ask of you to do and the things that we depend on you for are enormously important to the success of every federal mission and business activity we do today. It's just that simple. And I was thinking, I was talking to my son, he's 36 years old now, so he's, uh, he's kind of a little older than a millennial, uh, but not too much older. He grew up in an era where I, I controlled his internet access to the best of my ability. We didn't have all the stuff we have today. But I was telling him that, you know, it won't be too long before you're gonna buy a new car and that car is gonna be sitting in your garage and it's gonna wake itself up and contact the dealer. And the dealer is gonna re run remote diagnostics on that car. It's gonna open the garage door on its own. It's gonna drive itself to the dealer. It's gonna get serviced. It's gonna drive itself back home, shut the garage door and send you the bill in email. <laughs> That's already possible. You've seen the autonomous cars for Uber and Google's working on one. The point is, <clears throat> we are building an incredibly powerful world of information technology. It's awesome. I just had my 67th birthday, and I, I look around at where I started 40 years ago, standing in line with a deck of punch cards in the old IBM. Some of you graybeards out there are shaking your head. You remember those days. What a transformation. The technology is awesome. It's making us more productive. You're using it here at DOI. We've got the cloud and mobile. And that's the wonderful side of the technology. 
But there's also the other side of the technology, which you live every day. It's the, how do we protect all the stuff that we deploy? How can we be productive on one hand and carry out all those important missions and business functions that DOI has to carry out and still be able to stop an aggressive set of cyber attacks from very, very sophisticated adversaries? That's a tall order, and we're going to talk today about how uh, we can do a little better job of, of doing that, a very difficult task. But as I was coming in the building today, I always think about cybersecurity. Why, why do I do what I do? Every day we get up and go to work, and we have a purpose for what, why we do what we do. And to me, I, I could have retired a while ago, but I, I still see a lot of work yet to be done. And, and I never forget every day why I do cybersecurity. It's not because of the usual things you would think. But I always go back and think about the Constitution. And it's, it's hard to believe, but the original seeds for security and privacy were actually planted in that first document, the Constitution, the United States Constitution. And a lot of us have forgotten about that, but here's the, here's the preamble. And I, I always like to read this because there's a little phrase right in the middle of that that really instructs us in why cybersecurity is still important in defending the country. So, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. That's a pretty powerful document. Now, Providing for the common defense back in those days, the, our founding fathers didn't have smartphones and laptops and all the stuff that we, tablets, the stuff we have today. But there was always this notion of defending the country. And we did that in what we call kinetic space. Kinetic space is when you see a, an attack on the World Trade Center or the Pentagon, like on 9-11, that's a kinetic attack. And that is something that is etched in your mind all the time. What makes cybersecurity so difficult for everybody, this is not just a DOI or NIST or wherever you're doing it, it's the fact that we operate in cyberspace and that's largely invisible to most of us. So the question that I always ask everybody, what kind of a world are we gonna be leaving? What kind of a country are we gonna be leaving for our children and our grandchildren? That's an important question for my generation it's an important question for the younger people, the millennials who are here today, because cyber security and privacy are really fundamental things that we've always treasured as a country. And we have to be able to ensure that as we build all this wonderful technology out, we are able to protect what we deploy and maintain our personal privacy. And you can see today, you know, the headlines from the election that just transpired a couple years ago and all the things going on with that, the ability for an adversary to affect our national security and our economic security is unprecedented. In fact, I always uh, say that, you know, it took us a long time. We, we figured out how to defend ourselves in cyber, I'm saying in, in kinetic space, but we haven't quite figured out how to protect ourselves in cyberspace. And that's pretty dangerous because we are totally dependent on computers today. That's kind of what the presentation's all about. Pushing computers to the edge. And what does that mean? That means computers are going into everything that you can possibly think of. They're going into refrigerators. They're going into your Alexa that you put in your house that's looking and listening to you all the time. They're going into medical devices, pacemakers, in your chest with wireless access. That's when you want to make sure you know who your friends are, you know. <laughs> All of this technology is just, it's amazing. And the, the common denominator in everything we're doing today is that they're all computers. And that's why whether you're talking about an industrial control system in Illinois that provides uh, power for the city of Chicago, or you're talking about that small medical device, or some of the great software applications coming out of Silicon Valley and showing up on your smartphone, it's all about computers and software and firmware that drive those computers. And the sad truth today is that we do not have the trustworthiness of those applications, the middleware, the operating system, 
down to the integrated circuit. We just don't have the trustworthiness there that we need to be as protected as we need to be. Now that's a sobering statement, and it's something we have to really focus on because today, I would like you to start to think of cybersecurity in two different dimensions. One is the dimension that you deal with every day. All, all the folks in the CISO office and the CIO, they are running day-to-day -day operations and systems. And there's a whole bunch of things they have to do. Some people call it cyber hygiene. The continuous diagnostics and mitigation program where you count your assets, you configure all your components, you do your antivirus software, <clears throat> you do the Einstein, all the stuff that we need to do. Deploy all those NIST controls that you have to deploy. <clears throat> that's all cyber hygiene. But what about, that's above the water line. If you think of cyber as kind of like sharks and glaciers, everything bad that happens with sharks and glaciers happens below the water line. Everything above the water line where you're operating, you do everything you can do and you take care of business. But even if you're operating perfectly above the water line, there's still a whole lot of bad stuff going on below the water line, and that's largely out of your control. There, there's some to control, but not a whole lot. Why? <clears throat> because industry produces most of the things that you use here at DOI in the information technology or the IT, the system stack. And that stack, whether you're talking about cloud or mobile or the traditional mainframe environment, there's still a lot of those around too, the stack is all the same. It starts with applications and comes into middleware, the kind of like the, mid, the APIs and everything, the interface to the operating system. And then below that, we have firmware that integrates with the integrated circuits and then out to the network and you're off and running. Trustworthiness has to be applied at every part of that stack because the adversary likes to get as low as they can in that system. I say low, I mean the lower part of the stack gives them more control. They can compromise an application and they still have to deal with the operating system. So if your operating system is trusted, and we used to do those in the old days, the application can't affect the rest of the system and the rest of the applications because the OS, that's the lower part of the stack, is more trusted and provides that barrier from malicious code spreading or doing other damage. But today we don't do a lot of that. We, you know, the, the root kits and the things that they, the adversaries can install in your operating system can literally take complete control of your system and sometimes we don't even know we've been compromised. This is the part of the story that goes largely untold. There's a critical report that I hope every one of you will download. I don't have it on the slide here today, but. It, it's the Defense Science Board report. You can Google this, Defense Science Board Resiliency Military 2013. And that report was, it was in response to the DOD, the Defense Department asked a very important question. Could the United States military defend our country when a, there's a massive cyber attack going on by an adversary? And when they came back, they identified three levels of vulnerabilities that are very important to understand. This will, this will explain a lot of the frustration that you have and the reason why we still have a lot of cyber attacks that are successful. The first layer of vulnerabilities are something that you deal with every day here at DOI. They're called known vulnerabilities. You know you've got them. Sometimes the vendors will announce on Tuesdays. We call that Patch Tuesday. They announce all the patches. And then you run around, like most of us, with our hair on fire trying to determine, is that patch going to break my functionality and bring the system down or, or stop the services for the customer? It isn't like we don't want to patch, but we have to consider the mission all the time. So we have those known vulnerabilities, and we work really hard to get rid of as many as we can. See, everything is about risk, and a risk assessment looks at threat, vulnerability, impact to mission or business, if the threat actually exploits the vulnerability to cause the damage, the negative consequences, and then there's the likelihood that's going to happen. Today you can throw likelihood out because the likelihood is 100%. So given that scenario, you can kind of constrain your focus to uh, critical assets. We're going to talk about how to focus on the priority assets here at DOI and how we're going to have to learn to let other stuff go. It's just one of those things. We don't have enough resources and people to do everything to the highest degree. So known vulnerabilities, <clears throat> the next group below that are called the zero-day vulnerabilities or zero-day attacks. You've heard about that. 
That's where the adversary discovers something about your system or network that you don't know. But they're going to launch that attack. There's no defense for that on day zero. They launch the attack, you, you absorb the attack, you know about the attack, and now it's a known vulnerability, and it moves up to the, other, the, the next level up. The third level is once the adversary, through something called the advanced persistent threat, and that's happened many times to the federal government, the adversary takes complete control of your system, and they can actually build and deploy new vulnerabilities in your system that you didn't have to start with. In fact, I heard a very funny story. It wasn't really funny funny, but it was an amusing story about a cyber attack that was so good, the adversary had such capability, they actually did some repair of vulnerabilities in that system to make sure that system stayed operational because they were stealing stuff from them and they didn't want the system to go down. You, you see, the adversary has two things they can do to us all the time. They can either bring you down, that's an availability issue, or they can steal stuff from you. That's called exfiltration. That's OPM, 22 and a half million records of, you know, the SF-86 data. So this is the, this is the problem we have. Two-thirds of those vulnerabilities, the ones that are the zero days and the ones they create, are totally off your radar. And that's why this is a scary problem. Now, what do you do in that situation? Well, you don't throw your hands up. We have some really good guidance. It's already there in some respects, but we're 2018, 2019. We are doing some major modifications to NIST guidance, and we're going to focus on some of these things today. These are the three terms that I would like you to focus on as we move forward from 2018 and beyond. If we can't do all three of these things, we're, we're never going to get to the place where we're adequately protected. And look, at risk management is not the same for every organization. DOI has a risk management strategy. They have risk tolerance, which may be different than the Central Intelligence Agency or TSA, and that's fine. That's what risk management is, is really all about. In fact, the, the pure RMF application is really intended to give every organization the flexibility the agility you need to do the right thing. Now, sometimes that gets tortured and twisted in the world of implementation because we also have this notion of compliance and auditors and IGs and everybody trying to do the right thing, and sometimes the system just melts down because we get tired and the adversaries don't get tired and they keep on hitting us 24-7. So we have to find a better way to do business we want to be able to control the, the battlefield of cyberspace, if you will. In other words, it's, we've given the adversary the tactical advantage for way too long. It's time to turn those tables around, and, and we have really good ways to do that now. And the three things that are going to help us get there are simplification, innovation, and automation. You're going to hear this theme, simplification, all the way through the presentation today. It's about reducing complexity. We have too many things to manage today. You know, you can't protect what you don't understand. And every time you bring in a new box, a new application, a new system, and you can see a really good example of this on your smartphones and your tablets. I was issued a smartphone about two years ago. It was a Samsung. It was a brand new phone at that time. And of course, the first thing I ask our, our CISO and our cybersecurity team is, what apps can I download on that phone? Because I, I know the problem, you know. We all like to download apps. That's human nature. They told me the only apps you're allowed to download are mission essential applications. I said, that makes sense to me. Fast forward another month or two, I'm sitting in a theater uh, one night with my wife, and the, and the movie is about ready to come on. The announcer <laughs> comes on the screen and says, you can download an app for your smartphone right now that will tell you the optimal time to go to the restroom in the movie you're about to see. So now I'm thinking to myself, mission essential, not mission. So now for some of you younger people out there, that, that's not a mission essential app, but for me, I'm 67 years old, that's a mission essential application. So the point is, we're all making those decisions and, and we kind of have an addiction to this technology. I and mean, let's be honest with ourselves, even the people in our business we love the apps, we love the technology, and that's a blind spot. It's a huge blind spot because when you try to do whitelisting in an organization, that's a really unpopular thing. 
We, we can't even do it at NIST because I, I asked about that one day, and they said, well, you know, that means all the lab directors have to tell their, we got 3,000 scientists and engineers. You can't download that app, or you can't download that app, and that's not very popular. But you know what? Sometimes when you want to protect yourself for critical assets, you, you can't do what's popular. You have to do what's right, and that's a hard thing. We're going to have to learn that lesson, all of us, and because we just can't keep going the way we're going today. So simplification. Reducing your digital footprint, and we'll talk about how you can do that. What are some strategies you can take? Innovation. We have a lot of innovation with some of the new technologies that our, our great industries are bringing to us, whether it's virtualization or cloud or mobile. There's a lot more ability to protect the new technology than some of those old lumbering legacy systems where you couldn't even change the number of characters in the password. It was hardwired. You know, those are, those are the good old days. And then there's automation. Uh, the CDM program manager's here today. I, I was talking to him before I came up. CDM, DHS, providing a terrific automated capability to do the fundamentals, maintaining your asset inventory, making sure you're configured properly, doing the scans and feeding back on mitigations and all the things that kind of keep you healthy day to day. All of that cyber hygiene stuff is really important, and we have to keep doing that. But we're going to have to simplify the infrastructure because it's kind of like doing continuous monitoring. You know, you, you can, you can, there's, you have a broken lock on your front door. You can check that broken lock once a day or a hundred times a day. That broken lock is still broken if you don't fix it. We have to really fundamentally change through enterprise architecture how we build our information technology infrastructure, and, and that's where we're going to, we're going to try to focus on today. So. The president has a, an IT modernization strategy, and there's an office called the American Technology Council. And in part of this, there are, there's kind of three fundamentals that appear in that, uh, that strategy. And, and I think this is going to be something that you can try to focus on here as you start to move forward into 2018, 2019. Now look, at, you can't change everything on a dime. The most important thing is that you have a strategy on how to get healthy long term. And it's going to take a while to get this infrastructure reconfigured, thinned out, and for us to apply to our high value assets the needed protections to really be as bulletproof as we can be. So these are the three things where you can start to make a difference. The first one is moving more to shared services. Now, I've talked to OMB about this for a long, long time. Shared services is kind of, and enterprise architecture has kind of been decentralized to the federal agencies. Shared services to me, I could be wrong about this, but it looks like it was more of the exception rather than the rule. What I would like to see is that before any federal agency does any new system, they have to go through a gate and, 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 and answer a, a very important question. Is this the kind of service that could, that could be shared by other agencies. We do that with payroll now and things like some HR services, but we have a, a great opportunity to do a whole lot more of it. And just think about it. We have 24 federal agencies, and if every one of those deploys a new payroll system, for example, or HR, you've got four major investment costs. There's the cost of building that new system. That's the first thing. And then there's the maintenance tail for that system, which sometimes is more expensive than the original investment. And then you've got the initial security controls and all the things that go into that system, which has to be done from the start, big expense. And then you've got the ongoing continuous monitoring of that system. Four big ticket items times 24. Just think if you could reduce that to one or two systems. And that, the, those, shared, those services are shared by all the federal aid. We already do that to a limited degree, but if you really want to solve this problem, you have to elevate that federal enterprise architecture to the top of the government. And it's got to have, there's got to be strong leadership coming out of OMB to force that because we're all human and we like to have our own stuff. And if we can build a system and we have the money to do it, we're going to build our own stuff. But I would argue if you can let go of that concept and you can move to shared services, that's going to save you an awful lot of money. And that money can be turned around into other DOI projects that are related to cybersecurity or IT or things that you want to do on modernization. It's a really, really powerful concept. Second one is moving to the cloud. 
I've been dealing with cloud since 2009, since Vivek Kundra came in as the CIO and we built the FedRAMP program together. It was a collective effort with the OMB and with GSA and with all the federal agencies. And I'm thinking over the years, there's been a real hesitancy to move to the cloud. Some of the reasons are justified. Some are just, hey, I'm not going there because I don't really know what's in that cloud. You know, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant about that. And I, I'm a big country uh, music fan, so uh, Kenny Chesney had a, a very famous song. Any country music fans out here? You know, Kenny Chesney had a, a very famous song. He said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. That, that, that's a very famous country song. It's kind of like that with the cloud. Everybody wants to go to the cloud, but nobody wants to go right now. And so we've seen a very slow movement to the cloud, but I, I have to tell you that the cloud is an absolutely good thing to do if you can move some of your, your systems and services that are cloud ready. You know, you just can't move any system in the cloud. You have to sometimes restructure the mission business process so it can be cloud enabled. You can take advantage of what cloud offers. Uh, massive virtualization, uh, on-demand services. You don't have to own every box anymore. You can let the other guys own the boxes and the applications and you provision what you need. That's a powerful concept. You can see where we're heading here because when you start to do more shared services and you get rid of all that, you also then can move things to the cloud and you get rid of a bunch more stuff. And what you leave behind here within DOI are what we call high value assets. Now this is a goal state. We're obviously not there today, but you can see where we're trying to head. If you can reduce that digital footprint so you don't have the total responsibility for every piece of you know, software and hardware that you have to use to support your customers, now you can focus on your high value assets. And those, again, those high value assets will be different for every federal agency. DHS is going around to all the different agencies now and they're helping identify the high value assets and they're doing something important. They're looking at the connectivity of those HVAs. That's what's important. They found a lot of those high value assets are tethered, connected to other systems that are not necessarily high impact. I'm talking about the FIPS 199, high, moderate, and low. They're, they're finding a lot of this connectivity that was very invisible to the agency. And that's a big problem. That's why when you start to redesign your enterprise, architecture and engineering as part of enterprise architecture and building a good security architecture will be at the heart of the, this new 21st century view or vision that we're trying to develop based on these three core uh, concepts and principles. And you see, ultimately, we're trying to reduce complexity because even with all the automation that we have and all the scanning tools and all the things that are good, to, that we know are good and that we use every day, we still have an overly complex infrastructure. And this is a physics problem, folks. This is not something that we can make better by just hoping. It's physics and computer science have a, have a total discipline called complexity theory. And we've already outstripped the ability to understand all of that because we've gotten so big. Billions and trillions lines of code now across the country in the federal infrastructure and the private sector. Billions of devices billions of systems and devices in the Internet of Things. And we're looking, we're hooking all these things together now. That's, what's, that's what the Internet of Things is all about. It's your car that you're driving that's tethered to the dealer. I, I had a funny story. A friend of mine, uh, I was at the CIA one time taking, uh, uh, doing a briefing there, and I was in the heart of the building at Langley, and all of a sudden the, uh, they, they had this internal SWAT team got activated because they were getting a signal from somewhere in the building they shouldn't have been getting. They don't like signals emanating from inside of Langley going out. So they, they, were, they had the SWAT team out there and they were going room to room and they finally isolated the problem in the, the CIA cafeteria and they went to this dishwasher. The signal was coming out of the dishwasher, brand new dishwasher they just took delivery of last week, the week before. And what happened was the dishwasher was being updated remotely. The software was being updated by the vendor and they were doing that right into the CIA. You see the problem we're having here, folks? Even our highly classified, sensitive intelligence agencies are using the same technology that you're using here at DOI. That's a problem. We're all in this boat together, and we all have to 
make sure that we work together to, to make it better. So these uh, slides, I, I flipped these, are a little out of order here. So I'm going to talk about two big projects here that are very familiar to you. One is 853 Rev 5. And, and I think I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to flip to the other set first and then come back to those because I want to talk about 837 first. So just indulge me one minute here. About a year ago, we did a workshop with all federal agencies, and this was at the request of the American Technology Council and OMB. They wanted to see, is the RMF operating at peak efficiency? And how are the baselines doing? Do we still need all those controls in the baseline? People still think there are too many controls. Maybe some of you do. And so we had a workshop, and we brought everybody together, and we, uh, we looked at those two issues. And as part of the American Technology Council, and the OMB update with the IT modernization effort, NIST is updating five of our key publications. And you're going to recognize them right off the bat. We have FIPS 199, that's the categorization standard. We have FIPS 200, that's the minimum security requirements, 17 requirements. We have 853, which are our security and privacy controls. 837, which is the RMF, Risk Management Framework. And then 53 Alpha, which is the assessment procedures. So we started this process a long time ago, and one of the things we were doing, as you can see from 53 Rev 5, we were integrating privacy all the way out through the publication, not just putting the privacy controls in Appendix J. We were bringing them into the main catalog. So we discovered, as we were doing that, when it went out for a draft, there's an office in the White House at OMB called OIRA. They deal with regulatory authority. And they have the ability to, to really approve or disapprove any publication that's going out if it's a regulation or looks like a regulation. And those of you who know 853, it's not a regulation, but it looks like a regulation. So all of a sudden, we had a new partner. And we have to now we're working with OIRA. And we've identified uh, three publications where privacy is going to be infused into the publications. And so we started with 837. And on May the 9th, you're going to see the initial public draft of 837 Rev 2. This is called RMF 2.0, and that's what I'll be talking to you about today. So 37 Rev 2, it has a lot of uh, interesting things in it. The first thing we're trying to do is, you remember 839, the Enterprise-Wide Risk Management Guideline? That is kind of the high-level risk management process for organizations where you frame the risk, and then you do a risk assessment, and then you respond to the risks, and then you, you monitor those risks over time. That's kind of a high-level risk management process. All of that material was kind of disconnected from 837. So we have the C-suite operating here at DOI, and then we have all the operators on the ground actually doing the control selection implementation. And, of course, the CIO and the CISO's job is to kind of bridge the gap between the senior leaders and the operations folks on the ground to make sure that we're doing actual mission work that this, the C-suite cares about. Well, sometimes the people on the ground didn't have the top cover they needed. They, they wanted to maybe do some tailoring activities when they selected the baseline. Tailoring has always been a problem because people feel if they tailor out controls, they're going to get smacked by the IG or the, or the auditor. And nobody wants to be, and, and compliance was kind of driving that whole discussion. So what we did is we are providing a greater linkage. We're taking a lot of the material out of 839, and we're, we're putting it in a brand new step in the RMF. It's going to sit right in the middle of that six-step process that you've been using for a long time. It's called the, the preparation step. And the whole mission of that preparation step is to make sure the C-suite understands the problem, they understand the missions and the business of the organization, and they have a risk management strategy, and they actually prepare the system owners to execute the RMF at the system level. In other words, they're blessing the system owners to do what they have to do based on what they're telling them is important. So it's now they have to own the security and privacy problems. I've seen a lot of CISOs in my day and, and CIOs who uh, get blamed for things after that attack happens, and the senior leaders point to them and say, why didn't you do a better job? Well, look it. You, you can't do a, a great job if you're not given the tools and the structure and the support from the C-suite to do that work. 
We're all in this together. We have to operate as a team. It's no different than when I was in the military and you had a division or a corps commander. The commander's vision is established. It's passed down from the corps to the division, to the brigade commanders, down to the battalion commanders, down to the company commanders, and down to the platoon leaders. Everybody understands the commander's vision and you execute. That's what we're trying to achieve. And this is gonna be a real, I think, an innovation for all of that stuff. We're trying to also make things more cost efficient and cost effective because those, those baselines can be kind of daunting. We wanna be able to give every agency the ability not just to, to feel that they can tailor, but encourage them to tailor. Force them to make those tailoring decisions and have the support of everybody in the organization. So if something goes wrong, we can say, you know, we did our due diligence. We looked at everything. We did the appropriate things for adequate security and privacy. And yes, we got hit, but here's why we got hit. And it wasn't the fault of our security control selection process. It was the fact that the adversary was just a little bit better than we were on this particular day. That, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful notion, and we have to be able to get to that, that scenario. <clears throat> now, the cybersecurity framework, most of you have seen that framework. It, it was developed by NIST with, in collaboration with the private sector. The original intent back in 2014 was to give the private sector a framework they didn't have. We have our RMF, they didn't have anything. So the cyber framework was developed and it was popular. It's been doing great work out there. And then when the administration changed uh, in 2017, one of the executive orders that's related to IT modernization also requires the federal government to do the cybersecurity framework now. So my first reaction was, well, that's going to maybe not be too popular because our folks are going to say, oh, great, now I get two frameworks to do. I, I barely got my arms around the RMF, and now i got to do one more. So we took the, uh, the challenge to align the cybersecurity framework with the RMF. The idea is that when you are executing the RMF, which you have to do because of FISMA, you will be able to align with the critical functions and, and categories and subcategories and everything the cyber framework brings to the table. And so you're going to see in this RMF 2.0, you're going to see references to the cybersecurity framework in lots of different places, whether it's identifying your risk management strategy up front or whether you're reporting your vulnerabilities out through those five categories of the CSF, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. I think OMB is already aligning themselves with those functions as far as reporting goes. So again, we're trying to make things simpler, collapse things into things that are easier for you to deal with, more efficient, and certainly more cost effective. Because if we can achieve that, by definition, we're going to get better cybersecurity. Privacy, I just mentioned that in the RMF, it's one thing to have privacy secure, you know, controls in the catalog. But when you use the RMF, the RMF has been used up to this point for security professionals. All of your privacy people, they didn't have a framework. They didn't have that risk-based process to use. When A130, circular A130 was modified in 2016, that was the first time where you saw a coming together of security and privacy. It's a very important concept because Security and privacy have a very common overlap. Think of a Venn diagram, two circles, and they converge, and there's an overlap in the center. So think about where that overlap is. Privacy people worry about the unauthorized disclosure, confidentiality, of personally identifiable information. So security numbers and all the stuff that we worry about. That is something security people also worry about because if you look at our three tenants, our objectives, we have confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So that's where we have a common overlap. We want to make sure that unauthorized individuals don't get into the system to be able to see things they shouldn't see or modify things they shouldn't modify and potentially have an availability problem, bring down your capability or steal stuff from you. That's where we have the overlap. But privacy folks also care about what authorized people can do. We have a lot of authorized people at DOI that are in those databases looking at all that personal information. And so there's the rest of the privacy story goes to how much information can you collect on me? How long can you keep it? 
What can you do with it? Does anybody, does that ring a bell with the current Facebook situation that we've been looking at in the news? You see, this is the new world that we're building. We are positioning ourselves to give you real world controls and frameworks to deal with that kind of a situation here within DOI. And believe me, they haven't figured this stuff out yet in the private sector. That's where we have the Facebook thing, and, and it's not just Facebook. It's all those tech companies where you are interacting. That's, I call that the digital footprint that you have to interact with every day. We don't even have a choice anymore. You know, if you want to survive in this world, you've got to embrace the technology. The question is, how much control over any of this stuff do we have anymore? You know, think about that next time you download the app on your smartphone, like the one I talked about at the theater. That one, by the way, is called Run P, if anyone wants to download that, that app. <laughs> Uh, we're among friends here, right? So we can say that. So the first thing that, that happens when you try to download the app is it says, you have to give this application access to these 30 things. So what do you do? Ah, yes, go ahead and do it. Do you have any idea what you're giving them access to? No. Do you have any idea who wrote the application? No. Do you have any idea if the operating system on that iOS or the iOS or the Apple phone or the, the Android phone, is that a trusted operating system? No, because it's all buried below the waterline in the complexity. This is why industry has to step up and start to care about the security and privacy issues in the technology that they are giving to all of us that is going into not just our smartphones around the house and our Alexa and our dishwashers, but they're going into critical systems in our critical infrastructure. That's a big deal. And I don't feel very comfortable right now that we have enough control over this to, to, very, to sleep very well at night. And that's, a, that's something we're going to have to do a lot better at. So you're going to see privacy fully integrated into the RMF 2.0, and your privacy people now can make risk-based decisions. In fact, we used to have a term called security authorization. That's been changed now in A130. It's called a system authorization. We, we authorize systems, and we authorize common controls. But there's no notion of security authorization. Your senior agency official for security and your senior agency privacy official, the SAOP, will both have responsibilities to feed information to that authorizing official. And that one individual is going to be making a risk-based decision for the entire organization for that system or those common controls based on those two feeds from security and privacy. And if one's not up to par, that system can't go. Because if there's a privacy problem, you can't just go ahead and operate and expect the security is going to pick up all the, 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 the slack. It's not going to happen. And the same thing on the other side. If there's a problem with some of your security controls that leave the system exposed for an attack that's going to compromise PII from a non-disclosure point of view, that's a problem too. So we think that this is going to be a really, really great improvement. It's also going to allow you to meet your security and privacy people. You can kind of get to know each other. Now, I know here you've got the, the kind of like the open workspace concept, and I think your privacy folks may be able to look over those low partitions and see the security people, but in most agencies, they are far apart. They're in different offices. You know, they, they're not anywhere close to being, uh, you know, in, in shouting distance. So the framework, privacy, and here's what the new RMF looks like. It should be fairly comfortable to most of you. If you kind of squint your eyes, you can see the old framework around the outer edges. And then there's that new preparation step. And let me give you some of the outcomes now. That preparation step, it has two different aspects to it. When you look at that step, it's going to be bifurcated into two sections. There's stuff that is organizational prep at the at the organization level. You remember that diagram in 839, the, tr the, the pyramid, the triangle? It has governance, mission, then mission business process at layer two, and then it's got systems at layer three. That's how most organizations are, are structured. The preparation step is gonna deal with the organization level preparation, and then there's also gonna be system level preparation. When you start to get a little more specific for that particular system that you're gonna be dealing with. And that's what RMF 2.0 is going to look like. Now, here's some outcomes. I'm just going to roll these onto the screen here so you can kind of take a look. I want to save some time for questions today, so I may uh, just uh, go through these kind of quickly. Well, you can see that the first few up there are things that the C-suite is going to have to worry about, making sure that all the roles and responsibilities are assigned. Now, I know 
you're probably thinking, well, that, that comes automatically. But you'd be surprised if you look across all the federal agencies how sometimes those roles and responsibilities don't get assigned. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. Risk management strategy, that's really important because without a strategy, you don't have that commander's vision. And without a strategy, you're not going to have a risk tolerance. And then you're not going to know when, when is enough enough. When do I stop tailoring? When do I stop eliminating controls? When do I bring more controls in? How many controls do I need to bring in before my risk tolerance, I'm within that risk tolerance, that feel good spot that is going to have to be all of the C-suite. That's their decision. That's not a system owner's decision. That's why they have to own the problem space. They, they can't escape it anymore because without their blessing, you can be tailoring forever and not ever realize or, or feel good that you, you know, they've got your back or vice versa. Connecting security and privacy to mission and business is probably the most important thing we're ever going to talk about. Because every federal agency is different. And we, we don't have a one-size-fits-all. We have our baselines, but even then, some of those controls are not appropriate. My, my, my classic example is the air traffic control tower and the screensaver control. You know how, how after a certain amount of time, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, it goes off in the screensaver mode? Well, that's, that controls in every baseline, but yet you don't want to have that go off in the air traffic control tower in the FAA. So that's an example of legitimate tailoring out of controls that are in the baseline. And there could be a lot of those, depending on what you're doing. The DOD, for example, if they're building a weapons system, sometimes you can't do a lot of onboard auditing like we do in our AU family. So they tater those controls out for weapon systems because first, they don't need it. And second, they couldn't do it even if they wanted to do it because there's not enough storage capacity in that weapon system. You see, that's what the power of the RMF and tailoring really brings to the organization. You have to feel good about it. You can't do it because, you know, you, you just can't be skittish all the time and looking over your shoulder. The IGs and the auditors and compliance has to equal mission success. You know, we work in two different worlds where compliance is sometimes a bad word. And we feel the IGs and the auditors are, are working counter to our mission and our business objectives. You got to get them in the room early and say, look, here's what we need to do in our mission. Here's what we think we need to do to protect that mission. And here's how we're going to do it through a, a well-articulated set of requirements and controls. And then you bring them into the game and you say, okay, if you do that, that's your obligation now. You, here's what you said you're going to do. Now my job as an IG or an auditor is to check and see if you did what you said you were going to do or if there's a reason why things didn't work out well. You know, the world is not perfect. Stuff happens. And the IGs understand that, and you have to be able to convey that. But if you have a good plan, and you have a good execution model, then those discussions with the IGs where you're at each other should be minimal. If we can get to that point, we're all on the same team here, folks. You know, we're not fighting, you know, the, the adversaries overseas and here in this country there are, who are attacking our system, and we're fighting the IGs at the same time. This is not a two-front war. We're on the same team, and we need to make sure that we, uh, we always remember that. Stakeholders are important. Uh, they help us identify critical assets. Look, at, you have a lot of assets here at DOI, information assets, hardware, firmware, software, systems, networks, information. You have to be able to go through and do a criticality analysis. It's the old triage. That's what FIPS 199 is all about. High stuff, moderate stuff, low stuff, critical stuff for your mission, stuff on the other that's not important. That is essential to do that housekeeping first so you can then go back, move to the cloud. Some of the low and the moderate stuff can go to the cloud, shared services, and then your high value assets, that's the place. Most of those are going to be high impact. DHS, by the way, is building an overlay. It's out for public review now. You may have already seen it. It's called a high value asset overlay. They took the moderate baseline, 853 Rev 4, and they tailored for high value assets. At some point, that overlay will become mandatory, either through a binding operational directive from DHS or through OMB policy for every one of your high value assets. And as part of that process, they're working with CISOs and CIOs to see what those HVAs are connected to. And ask the very important question, do, do all these connections need to exist? 
they found a lot of them don't need to connect. First of all, there were a lot of surprises. They found connections they didn't know they had. And so they could obviously go away. If they didn't need them, they don't, they'd get rid of them. Some connections are, are, are needed. And you have to have them for mission operations. We understand that. But again, reduce complexity. Minimization. You know, the, what's one of the hallmarks? Least privilege, least functionality. Two of our fundamental controls. That's what whitelisting is all about. You only deploy the functions, the protocols, the applications, and the services that you need to do the mission and no more. Why? Because every time you bring in something else, you're increasing your attack surface, and you're giving more advantage to the adversary. That's, we have to fight that every day, because attack surface grows almost like fungus. It's uncontrolled sometimes, and that's not a good thing. OK, so a few more objectives here. Risk assessment, that's nothing new. The stakeholders weighing in on their protection needs. This is where the discussion I mentioned earlier has to start. A lot of times, we go right to the baselines and we start to tailor. A better strategy is to work with the C-suite first and establish what we call their protection needs. This is even before you get to security requirements and way before you get to system requirements. The stakeholders have a certain set of needs that emanate from the mission and the business. And that those protection needs get translated then into security requirements. And those security requirements operate as part of a larger set of system requirements. So when you're deploying a new system or building a new system or doing a major upgrade, you have all the things the system has to do to provide services to the customer and to satisfy core DOI mission and business objectives. And then you have security requirements, which are a subset of those requirements. They're all requirements. Some are mission, some are security. And those are the ones that have to be hardwired into the system requirements. So they all move at the same speed through the life cycle. Because many times we get to the end of the life cycle and that security discussion never took place. We want to put the system owners in the position where they have an early discussion with the stakeholders in the C-suite. So those things are, have already been decided. They've been budgeted, the investment dollars have been set aside, and you are off and running down the pike. Your job then is just to execute and fulfill those requirements with a set of controls that work. And that's kind of a, a different way than we're used to. I talked about security and privacy architectures. This is pretty important. What a, what a security architecture and a privacy architecture really is very simply. When you look at the enterprise architecture, you have the classic enterprise architecture has the the segment architectures and the solution architectures. And it really is a, a way that you organize all of your IT assets. And you make sure that you consolidate, standardize, and optimize. Those are the three buzzwords coming out of EA. And again, those if you do those, you're reducing complexity, and you're reducing your attack surface, and you're reducing your digital footprint. So those are good things to do anytime. But when you do that, your enterprise architect should be working with your security architects and your security engineers. And all that really means is that when they're doing the enterprise architecture, they can turn to that expert who's a security expert, and they can say, as we build out the infrastructure here within DOI, or we modernize, or we're doing the next gen, where are the appropriate places for us to be placing those controls and all the things that we talked about from the protection needs all the way down through the life cycle? You kind of work together. Enterprise architecture, system development life cycle, security engineering, all those kind of disciplines that operate separately in most organizations, you got to bring them together in something called the integrated project team. It's kind of like NASA in the old days when they were doing the shuttles, and I go back to the old days of the Mercury and the Gemini and the Apollo. You remember in Houston they had that big control center, and they're getting ready to do a launch, and there's a whole bunch of people around the table. And they go to each one of the mission areas, and they say, good to go or not good to go, and they give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And if any one of those mission specialists gives a thumbs down, they stop the launch sequence, and they fix the problem, and then they continue the launch sequence. We, we have to do that same thing. And by the way, we, we also have to involve the acquisition team. How many times have you seen a requirement go out where you know you gotta do FISMA stuff, so you're getting a new component, new system, new piece of software, and in the acquisition, the folks in the acquisitions side see, and the system must be FISMA compliant. It's got a whole long list of functional things, but then for security, it just says 
the system must be FISMA compliant. And they're left to shake, you know, what do they do with that? We've got to be more explicit. Those security requirements must be clearly stated or your controls in the acquisition, in the RFP. Contractors have to respond to something, and it can't be generalities, because when you do things in a general sense, one of two things are going to happen, and both of them are bad. Either the contractor is going to load up the stuff and give you a whole lot more than you need, or you're going to get a whole lot less than you need. And either one of those things is not good. You want to get in that sweet spot driven by real mission, real business requirements, and the involvement of security all the way through the life cycle. That's when you get the best results. Common controls are a salvation. They are the system owner's best friend. One of the things in the preparation step that we're requiring now, we always said this, but now it's actually in that prep step. Organizations will have to define their common controls before any system owner gets involved with anything. Now, we know that your system owners are already deployed. There's already systems out there. But again, going back and take a zero-based look, because look at common controls are there for a reason. It means that for every common control you deploy, and again, you have the same investment cost. You've got to build the control or deploy it, monitor it, all the stuff that takes resources and time and energy. The more things you can move to common space, and most of those are going to be management and operational, but occasionally there's technical controls that you can move to common, then the system owners can inherit that capability. And by the way, in RMF 2.0, Remember I said we're authorizing systems, we're also authorizing common controls, which means there's going to be a common control provider and there's also going to be a common control authorizing official, which means the AO is taking responsibility and being accountable for those common controls that are being inherited by that system owner. That system owner is not hanging out by himself or herself anymore. And that's a good thing. You get that assurance that those control, or you can see the risk-based decisions the common control provider went through. And you may say as a system owner, hey, I'm not going to inherit that common control because you've taken a little bit too much of a risk-based decision for my liking. And I'm not really ready to go there yet. And then that can be a discussion you can elevate to the C-suite and make sure that common control is either fixed or substantially improved in, in the throw weight in the protection of that particular control that is providing to the system owner. So it's a really big deal in that regard. Here's one that's really important. This is an optional task in the new uh, RMF 2.0. When you do your categorization here at DOI, I would imagine that there's a normal curve distribution of systems. This is what most federal agencies look like. You have the, most of your systems are moderate impact in that big center of the bell curve. Maybe 70% or more of your systems are moderate impact. Then you've got the other 30% are kind of split between high impact and low impact, maybe 10 to 15% either side, and that varies. What do you do with all those moderates? How do you make good risk-based decisions on when you want to tailor? Because that's a lot of systems in that moderate. So what we recommend you can do is do another categorization or another prioritization within that big group of moderate systems. In other words, you do kind of a second level FIPS 199. You say, of all my moderate systems, they don't all look the same. Maybe some of those are high moderate systems, more important. Maybe some are moderate moderate, and then some are low moderate. And why would you want to do that? Because now, when you want to start moving stuff to the cloud, and you're a little bit uncertain, go to your low moderates first. So send all your low impact and your low moderates to the cloud without even blinking an eye, and then move to your moderate moderates. And then if you get a little bit bold, move your high moderates. It gives you more of a spread to make better risk-based decisions. That's the only reason you would want to do that, that, that second level. Otherwise, all your moderates look alike. And you may be making decisions that may not be appropriate because that moderate system over there, I just know it's more important than that one. I just didn't have the ability in FIPS 1 and 9 to, to break it down any finer. All I was given is three choices. OK. Last couple. There's a task that allows the enterprise, the organization, DOI C-suite, to come up with tailored baselines for the entire organization. Now, I don't know if you do that today. Some organizations already do that. But the DOD is the one that really gave us the idea on this. They said, look, we have a lot of a tremendous number of systems. Some are command and control systems. Some are weapon systems. Some are logistics. We would like to develop for all of DOD 
a set of tailored baselines. In other words, we'll start with our categorization, our low, moderate, high, and then we at the C-suite, in collaboration with our CISO and our, our, our privacy officer and our CIO, are going to pre-tailor the baseline for every system owner who has that, that flavor of system. And then that's what you get to do. Now, that may not be comfortable for some system owners who want more flexibility, but it does give you marching orders, and then if something goes wrong, it's on the guys in the C-suite. So that's a way to save a lot of churn downstream when you have every system owner looking at two similar systems making different decisions, and maybe DOI wants to have a level of consistency across tailoring throughout all of the organization. And you guys have a lot of different bureaus and a lot of diversity. This would be a way to allow you to do that for all the different diverse bureaus that you have within, within the department. And then lastly, we have an organization strategy for continuous monitoring. Most feds are doing that now. The organization has a big top-level strategy, and then continuous monitoring strategy gets pushed down to the system level, and you have one for the system. So there's nothing new there. Okay, let me go back now and hit 853 very quickly. Kind of doing this in, in reverse order here, but I think uh, it'll make more sense now to you. Okay, so 853 started out about a year ago now, and this is our fifth revision. Those of you who have been watching this document, it's been out since 2005. Revision 5 has a lot of new changes in it, and I just want to cover some of the things. You've already seen the initial public draft. This publication has been delayed because we're working with OIRA at the White House now on privacy. 837, we made a strategic decision to work on that publication first. Get the process right for the RMF. This is the next one out of the shoot. This one will be finalized by the end of this calendar year. Here's some of the things you're going to see. First of all, we are moving the, the, all the security and privacy controls are be more outcome-based. Now, they're not totally outcome-based yet, but you know how the classic controls look in Rev4? They all start one of two ways. The system does X, Y, or Z, or the organization does A, B, C. Kind of gives you a reference point. Well, we've decided to take away those initial reference points, so there's no more system or organization. We just give you basically the task at hand for that control. So instead of seeing a control that says uh, the system implements two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, it now just says implement multi-factor authentication. Now, for we had some people who were freaking out when we took away all those, those terms. They said, how do we know where that control is deployed? You know, We can't operate like this. So we put a table in the back. And for those of you who are still uncomfortable with that new language, you can see every control will show you where that new control, where, where it emanates from in the system or the organization. So we're keeping a little bit of the old, they're kind of like training wheels so everything doesn't go away too quickly, and yet you can go back and find that information if you want it. This is really good, by the way, for not just RMF practitioners uh, at the enterprise level. This is great for systems engineers who are using our controls as part of a life cycle engineering process. Engineers hate to be told how to do stuff. They want to be told, just tell me what needs to be done. I'll figure out the best place to do that. Maybe the system, maybe the organization, but I'll figure that out. So that's one of the reasons why we did that. All the privacy controls in Appendix J are being integrated into the main catalog. There's going to be one catalog now of controls. Now, what happened to all those controls in Appendix J? They went to one of three places. First, we have two privacy families instead of eight. So now we have 17 original security control families. We have the program management family, that's, that's family 18. And we have the two new privacy families, 20 families in the catalog. So a bunch of the privacy controls in Appendix J went to those two new privacy families. The second group of privacy controls went to our program management family. You can see that the number of PM controls grew from around 15 or 16, now we got close to 30. All those new PM controls, for the most part, are privacy controls coming out of Appendix J. Now, what happened to the rest of them? Well, we discovered something very interesting. The rest of the controls got absorbed by the security controls. And when that happened, we call those joint controls. And we're going to change the name of some of the controls so you don't think they're just security controls anymore. 
And the one example I think that will be most illustrative is the AT2 control. That's the awareness, the security awareness and training control. Most of you are aware of that one. It's, it's in all the baselines. We shorten the name to awareness and training, and now that becomes a joint control. The security folks have a requirement to develop an awareness program, a training program for, for all the people here at DOI. That's probably why you're here today, to fulfill some of those requirements. But the privacy folks also have a, a requirement to do an awareness training program for privacy. So we come together in one control. The groups come together, hey, can we do this in one day? Can we have one auditorium and maybe give two sessions, one for security, one for privacy? See, we're trying to make more efficient. We're trying to get them to cooperate, collaborate, and also do things smarter and more efficiently. So you see a lot of those uh, joint controls coming out of that. We're also trying to clarify the relationship. I talked about why security and privacy overlap in that Venn diagram. That's really described also in Rev 5. Cybersecurity framework. You're going to see that we took a lot of the graphics out of 53 Rev 5. Remember in, in Rev 4, we had the triangle that comes out of 839, the, the pyramid of the organization, mission, and system. And we had a picture of the RMF. Those pictures are all gone from Rev 5 now because we're trying to decouple process, which is the RMF, from controls. And why are we doing that? Because the controls in Rev 5 are going to be used by you in the RMF, they may also be used by people doing the cybersecurity framework in the private sector. They may choose to use 853 controls because we have the best control catalog. It's the richest and deepest and most robust catalog of any of the five choices you get with the cybersecurity framework. So we wanted to make sure people could use their own framework and still use our controls. So you're seeing a separation of process from controls. That's why we're, we're doing that. That's another example of that same type of change. We're always bringing new controls in. I know the catalog is getting to be, I guess the word behemoth might be a good word for the number of controls there. It's large, but every control that goes in that catalog, don't forget, that's not just something we throw in there because we have nothing better to do. We work with the DOD and all the intelligence organizations uh, we have top secret clearances. Uh, some of you have top secret clearances, SCI possibly. And we work with our partners as part of the joint task force, so we understand the threat space. Every time there's a new threat that's new or something that maybe a cyber attack that's been launched that surprises us, we go back and we try to build a new security control that will address that problem. The best example I can use is we had an attack several years ago on the BIOS, the basic input-output, the firmware. And we had to come up with a new enhancement to one of our controls that dealt with something called firmware integrity. And a lot of our companies, like Dell and some of the companies who deal with BIOS, they would actually reflash the BIOS to make sure that the BIOS they were putting into that machine that they were getting from the supply chain had actually not been tampered with. And remember I talked about getting low in the stack? The lower you get in that stack, when you compromise firmware, you remember the Intel problem we, we heard earlier this year? about the, the chip problems they're having now with the operating systems and all the vulnerabilities that are hardwired at the chip level, that's a problem. Once those are discovered, they're hard to change because we have a tremendously large installed base of chips and firmware. But now that the adversary knows about those things, they're going to be trying to exploit those weaknesses and deficiencies, the ones that are actually vulnerabilities. Not all of them are vulnerable, vulnerabilities, but some of them are. Okay, now I'm going to fast forward. How much time do we have left? Okay, so we're way over already. I get too carried away here. I'm going to go right to the end here. And uh, I'm going to get back to where we left off. As Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. Okay, a few other... I mentioned we're modifying FIPS 199 and FIPS 200. We're also modifying our security planning uh, guidelines. Very old, needs a lot of update. We're updating 800-60, which is our catalog of when you do the categorizations and all the different low, moderate, and high, and the different data types. That's going to be aligned totally with the CUI initiative coming out of the National Archives and Records Administration. 
Once 53 Rev 5 is close to completion, we're going to be working in parallel so we can deliver as soon as possible all those new assessment procedures that you guys are counting on to be able to assess all the controls in Rev 5. We also are developing a NIST automation project. Rev 5 will be the last publication that, you, that is delivered as a full publication. In the future, all of our updates to the control catalog are going to be probably done online. We're going to socialize new controls in a beta section online so you can make your comments, you can try them out, give us your comments, and then we will be updating the control catalog almost virtually in that it'll be an ongoing, it's kind of like the equivalent of ongoing authorization for the 853. Occasionally we'll go back and update all the chapters and some of the material up front, but that category is going to be near real time or real time for you as we move it forward in time. That way you don't have to wait three or four years for controls you need today. And you'll also have more direct input and comment on controls that are not working as well. You can tell us your problems, things that are not quite working as we anticipated. That's taking advantage of the technology in, in a really good way. We published about a, two weeks ago or so a cyber resiliency guideline. It's the second in our security engineering series. I highly recommend you go take a look at this. This is to help you protect your legacy systems here at DOI when you want to make them more cyber resilient. And what does that mean? Survivable. How do you make these systems survivable against these very high-end cyber attacks? There's a lot of controls from Rev4 that we reference in an appendix that you can do today to make your systems a little bit more stealthy. That's why I said change the calculus. Don't always cede the tactical advantage to the adversary. Use deception, domain separation. There's lots of things you can do to make it difficult. Remember, once the adversary comes through your boundary, they've now defeated your first level of protection. Your penetration resistance has failed. Now they're inside. Your only mission now is to limit the damage. And you do that by kicking them out as fast as you can or don't let them move anywhere very quickly. And we have all kinds of things to help you do that. Well, that's what it's all about, defending cyberspace. We haven't quite learned how to defend ourselves in cyberspace. We're still learning that, and the clock is ticking, folks. This stuff's all connected. Kinetic warfare, cyber warfare, protecting the country, protecting our economic interests, protecting our national security interests. There used to be a big, bright line between all those things, national security, economic security. Today, it's all rolled together into one big ball of complexity. Here's some websites. You're probably already all over these things, but I always list these. It gives you real things you can go to that reinforce some of the things in, our, in the talk today. And again, I'm just going to roll through these. These are all things that we've talked about. You'll have copies of the presentation. A couple of support tools. We have a brand new publication on uh, 800 if you're working with non-federal organizations and they're dealing with controlled on class information. You want to focus on 800-171, and we have a brand new assessment guideline and a handbook which gives you a very nice checklist on how to work with your private sector partners. That is about it. Um, we've come a long way today. These are the three things that are absolutely essential if you want to move forward and have a, a nation that is well protected in the 21st century. There is no substitute for strong leadership. You have great people here at DOI. You're very lucky. Strong leadership, good governance, and being held accountable for what we do as individuals, as organizations, as bureaus, as a department, as a, a nation with our federal government. Everybody needs to be in this fight together to win. Once the adversaries own your information system, they very shortly will own your intellectual property. And as we've seen with the OMB breach and with the many other breaches, they can own our national secrets. Once they own your national secrets, then they can actually own your identity. That means you could be driving down the interstate and get stopped by a, a Maryland state trooper. Someone could have stolen your identity. They could be hauling you in because someone else has committed a crime in your name. That's not a very good feeling because they stole your identity somewhere down the, the pike. Once you've lost your identity, then they own you. And this circles back to where I started this whole discussion today with the Constitution and what kind of world are we leaving to our children 
and our grandchildren, once they've done that, you've lost your freedom. And that's why every day when I get up, the only reason I come to work is because, to me, cybersecurity and privacy and getting this right with the technology that we're deploying today is job number one for every one of us, whether we're in a senior leader position or you're on the front line of the cyber fight in DOI, you know, on the CISO team or on the teams that are protecting the systems. Everybody has an important job to do. President Kennedy said it best when he was visiting uh, NASA down in, when we were, this is early 60s. He was walking through the halls of NASA on one of his visits and he came across a janitor that was pushing the broom down the hall and uh, the, the janitor stopped and said, good, good morning, Mr. President. And President Kennedy looked at the janitor and says, um, sir, what, what do you do here at NASA? And the janitor looked up to me and said, Mr. President, I am helping put a man on the moon. And just think about that. Every one of us has a job, and you get up every morning and think that my job is not that important as me. Every job, and we learned this in the Army, it's true in the Army, in the military, everybody has an important job to do. And when you look at that kind of an organization, when you have everybody feeling that they are a critical part of the mission success here at DOI, that's the gold standard. That's when you know everything is clicking on all cylinders. Thank you guys very much for being so patient today. Here's my contact information. My cell phone is there, my email. You can call me any time of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I work all the time. And if there's, there's no problem, it's too small. You, I work for you, and I want you to take advantage of that because if you have a question, you don't want to talk to your boss about it, you want to talk about it first, make sure you're on solid ground, pick up the phone, send me an email. I'm glad to work with you guys. And again, uh, maybe there's not as much time for questions, but... Um, I hope we have a few time, a little time anyway. And thank you very much for coming today. Thanks for being on the phone. You guys are great. We love you guys. Okay. okay. Yeah, Ron. We do. Um, we are way over, but we do have a few minutes for questions. We, we um, have time for questions. We have time for questions. If you're in the mid auditorium, you'll notice there's mics strategically placed in, in the four corners. Please step lively to the mics and uh, ask your questions as we are running uh, short on time. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Ross, this is Ben Liberty, uh, CDM Program Manager. I know you and I spoke uh, briefly beforehand. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us this morning. We really appreciate it. Um, my question is regarding the CDM program. OMB is releasing a new um, policy, the new M1403. And in that policy, they speak to CDM achieving a couple goals, um, ongoing authorization and uh, automating um, FISMA reporting. In your thoughts, what is NIST's role in, the, in helping us achieve that moving forward? Thank you. Yes, ongoing authorization and achieving the automation of the reporting process and the metric, all that. Very important. Uh, NIST, NIST's role is always to give you the guidance the, and the tools, if you will, if the, everything in the controls and the frameworks. Those are all tools to help you do your job. And our guidance needs to help you achieve those goals. So for ongoing authorization, we try the new 837 talks a lot about that. We have a couple of new authorization approaches. You can use an authorization to operate or authorization to use if you're going to a shared service. And ongoing authorization is, is really difficult because you have to have a mature continuous monitoring program first. So the first step in that is to making sure that the C-suite and DOI has a good continuous monitoring strategy for the department. And then that strategy is going to be articulated down at the system owner level. So our role is to give you guidance in both 837 and in 800137. But then, as always, your job is to tailor that. Everything we put out at NIST is not put out in stone tablets. There's wiggle room in there, and there's flexibility to tailor to your needs here at DOI. So for auth ongoing authorization, you're going to want to focus on the controls that you decide on, how often? What's the frequency of monitoring? That's going to be different. Everybody's risk tolerance is going to be different for different types of controls. That's why you want to involve the C-suite to the max extent possible, making sure those decisions are taken as high up as they can so you then can feel good about execution down at the level of ongoing authorization. It's a process to get to ongoing authorization. It doesn't happen overnight. You have to get that comfort level, and we're still, we're still learning our way through all this and feeling our way through it. So OMB is providing new metrics. I heard today they are providing 
uh, actually they're going to be checking some metrics on controls that are not in baselines. Now, I, I would ask a question about that, you know. We have to be good consumers. If, if they're going to be asking you to do metrics on controls that are not in baselines, and I would come back to NIST and say, why aren't those controls in the baselines? Or go back to OMB and say, why are you checking on things that aren't in the baselines? So we can work together as we, you know, get the, the, the guidance comes out of OMB. We have a whole new series of automation NISTers. Those are interagency reports. We, we just published, uh, Kelly Dempsey is the lead on that, published our third in the iteration of 20, and what it does is it does a deep dive on, on how to automate the parts of the CDM program, giving you more guidance on these very specific areas for software, inventory assets, and all those things. So keep an eye out for those things, and then just always involve the C-suite and make a plan. Show them your long-term plan, show them your short-term plan, and more importantly, show them progress as you make your steps, your baby steps to that bigger goal. Hope that answered partly your question. Anybody else? We have time for one more quick question. Yes, and then all your other questions, unfortunately, and those of you who are in the live stream here, send me your questions on email. I'll make sure I answer every, every one of them. Anybody else? Ah, way in the back. Hi, Dr. Ross. Um, excellent uh, presentation. Just wanted to get your thoughts on um, continuous monitoring and say the mobile de device space. So, you know, we didn't start there, but at what point do you think that's going to get uh, critical and where do you see? Um, yeah, um, so your question about continuous monitoring and mobile devices and how that all fits together. And look, I, I think Thank mobile you. devices, I look at those as just another device. It's another endpoint on a very complex infrastructure. Now, one of the things we had to deal in mobile, as you brought it up, is, you know, we have this two-factor authentication requirement that goes back a long way. Well, first thing that happened with mobile devices is, well, I don't want to have to carry around my, my dongle or whatever that, uh, my RSA token. I could do two-factor authentication where the device is separate from the device that you're actually connecting to the system. People didn't want to do that. So we had to, we had to invent the derived credential. That came out of NIST a little bit after that two-factor requirement. So now you have those credentials stored on the same device. That's a risk-based decision. I'm giving that as an example because as the new technology rolls out, IoT is another example. We're working on something called light crypto, where you don't have on a device or a sensor, you don't have enough room to do the full crypto, but you can do something that is still crypto, but it's a lighter version, a less strong version. That's perfectly fine. That's part of risk-based decision making. And when you look at all your different devices here in DOI, tablets, smartphones, laptops, workstations, you're going to have to look at each one of those and look at the set of controls in the baseline or how you tailor in general, and then you may have to apply a specifically tailored set for that particular type of technology. And that's okay. As long as it's part of a risk-based decision where your eyes are wide open, you're making that decision. I was working with the CDC a while back, and they were collecting information on, uh, I think there were AIDS patients. They were trying to gather information from a community out there they were dealing with, gathering important information. And, you know, they were asking people to log into, like, kiosks, and you're not going to be using two-factor authentication for that. The mission overrode the two-factor requirement then because it was more important to gather that critical data so the healthcare organization could act on that data and, and do some important things. We make those decisions every day. So just remember that these devices are very powerful. That smartphone you carry around is more powerful than some of the computers that were on board those early NASA uh, spacecraft. So treat them as computers first, operating systems, applications. They're all there, maybe just a smaller version, but they still are a dangerous attack vector for the adversary. And so always keep that in mind and, and make sure that you just factor that into your risk-based decision. Continuous monitoring would be the same thing. When you monitor anything, there's going to be nuances that are going to be, when you come to mobile, that you're not going to be, like with laptops, it may be easier. I can't scan a smartphone as much as I do a laptop because it's going to wear the battery out, right? So there's, there's all kinds of decisions like that that are perfectly legitimate to make. But the IG and the auditors want to see you went through the thought process. That's what the most important thing is. Thank you guys very much. Again, you've been very patient. I appreciate it. <laughs>